First of all, apologies for the video quality. My main shooter is still out of commission somehow. Anyway, in this video I'll be dissecting an MSI Armored GTX 1066GB and endeavoring to improve its thermal characteristics. I did not do before and after benchmarks because the car left my possession before I had a chance to do so, but I did do a 2 hour long heat soak stress test and I was rewarded with a nice to have 8 degree cooler core, but more importantly a very significant memory temperature improvement. More on that in a bit. This car was not filthy by any stretch of the imagination, but I still chose to properly clean it before reassembly. This is what actually took up most of my time, considering that the whole procedure took only about 25 minutes, and I would say a good 15 minutes of those were spent cleaning the fans with a Q-tip, so the, on the whole it wasn't too bad. We start by taking off the cooler, and 4 screws later that task is complete. Nothing can beat simplicity. I hate those warranty stickers, they are very annoying to take off, it's much simpler to try and peel them off before you piece them in disassembly. If ever you need to return a GPU or any PC component for that matter and the seal is broken, insist that the warranty must be honored because the seal was never there. It's not enforceable, not in the EU or anywhere else. After the cooler is off, I continue to take it apart and get the fans off in order to have good leverage for cleaning them. This is why I feel I should point out that the cooler is meh, meh at best. Most decent GPU coolers will be constructed using a thin stack technique. Essentially loads of small stamp plates that are joined together using heat pipes and sometimes a central vapor chamber that sits on top of the GPU. This is not that. On this GPU MSI used a much simpler cheaper extruded aluminium block and attached a heat pipe to it that runs on top of the GPU die so it better dissipates the heat. While adequate for this 120 watt card, I would not want to see this type of construction on any other card that draws more power than this. The surface area would simply not be enough to effectively dissipate any more heat. That is not the main failing of this design, far from it. When inspecting the card I noticed that the memory chips did not have any thermal pads on top and had a gap of about 1mm to the heatsink. Because of the aforementioned cool design, no air from the fans can circulate down there. If the cooler had a thin stack design, not having direct memory cooling would be perfectly acceptable as there would be plenty of airflow, but like this those memory chips get uncomfortably hot during gaming. I used a semi-accurate infrared thermometer and I managed to get a reading of a couple that fluctuates between 80 and 84C within GDR5 specification but only squeezing by by 1 degree Celsius. I then tried the torture test with a mining application to read the worst case scenario temperatures and 5 minutes in it went over 92C at which point I ended the test. Yes, I am aware no one will probably mine on a 1060 again, it was just used as a worst case scenario. And mind you, those are GDDR5 memory modules, not GDDR6 like the newer cars which have a higher TJ Maxx, so pff, 92 degrees is way up there. Again, I should preface this that my infrared thermometer is not really rated for such high temperatures as is tuned for taking human temperatures. It does have a general setting that can be used all the way up to 160C, so even if it's reading a couple of degrees more, the temperatures are still not great. The 1060's GDR5 memory modules do not have any thermal sensors and as such they were allowed to heat up uncontrolled and as far as I can tell there is no thermal throttling in place with the memory effective speed staying constant. And now for the preventive maintenance part of this video, adding some thermal pads to cool down those memory modules during usage. I only have some 3mm jelly ultimate pads left over from a previous project that uh, they are not ideal but they will do. They are way too thick and too tough, but with a bit of persuasion and careful squishing using a spirit level, I managed to get them down to about 1.3mm thick or so. It will not be perfect by any means, but when the alternative is no contact whatsoever, the fact that the pressure might be uneven begins to sound like a pedantic concern. I use the same spirit level to make sure that the pads do not stick too much over the GPU die so that the cooler is not held off. They will compress a bit but nowhere near the more pliable ones like the Jellied Extreme so this needs to be taken into account from the get go. Because going down this route of using harder and thicker pads does include a bit of a hit and miss scenario. Because we do not have memory thermal sensors to work with, the next best thing is to check the GPU die temperature, which will usually be the edge temp. And if available because it's a lot more telling, then we can also check the hotspot temperature. I was very happy to discover that my hotspot temperature went down by a very respectable 8 degrees Celsius and if memory serves, the gap between the core and hotspot temperature was also reduced from 12C to 7 to 8C 
C, which signaled that incredibly the GPU die is making better contact with the cooler than before. Although a lot of that difference can be put down to the fact that the MX5 thermal paste that I use is much better than whatever came in from the factory. In terms of absolutes, the core went down from 78 to 70 C and the hotspot is now hovering between 76 and 78 C, way below the 82 to 84 C previously experienced. I am now regretting not spending more time with this card and gathering more data, but I did stress this for a couple of hours and in heaven the memory temperatures at the approximate safe spot I measured before went from 84C in heaven to a much nicer 72C. I mean, talk about improvements. But what about undermining load? Well, I left it to mine for a couple of hours using an aggressive memory overclock. Don't worry, it will not make me rich, it wasn't even connected to any account, as it was just running the nice hash demo, and the maximum I got was 74C, at which point I felt that this card is 100% operating at peak efficiency and there really isn't anything more that I can do to improve the situation. I spent the next couple of hours overclocking as much as I could this card, because the 1060 is a relatively modern Pascal GPU, so it's a lot easier to overclock than all the models, with the card dynamically scaling back the clock to avoid instability. While before the mods the best I could get was a 1940 MHz core and a plus 120 Mbps on the memory, in all honesty I wasn't pushing it before knowing that the temperatures weren't good, after the service I got plus 380 Mbps on the memory without issues and a stable 2 GHz clock in heaven. I found I could get way more than this but the law of diminishing returns bit down hard and there really wasn't any point, as the results were all within the margin of error or even regret at some point. And now a quick little bonus to this video. I did get my hands on another GTX 1060, this time from KFA2, a company better known as Galax. The cooler is still a chunk of aluminium and there are no thermal pads on top of the memory modules, but this is where the similarities end. Where the MSI did not have any airflow provisions, this has tactically placed slits to allow for air cooling of the PCB components and also provides a thermal pad on top of the power delivery components. It's an improvement in design without a lot of extra cost and if it was me I would definitely choose this one over the MSI Armor one. And that's about it for this video, if you wanna see this card being benchmarked in its intended system I'll link in the appropriate video in the description. Hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next one.